We're going to go into these seven bits. Brand breadth. Well, my job used to be super simple, okay? When I started doing this back in the 50s, um, it was simple, really. That, you know, that it was called corporate identity, and I mainly did logos and symbols. Occasionally, I'd do a sign or something printed, and every now and again, we'd have a bizarre discussion about a typeface. That was kind of it. And it was beautifully simple, but that was kind of it. Now, the map that you might draw now has kind of this... Uh, hub in the middle and then the spokes that fly off the hub of what I now do are extraordinary and keep changing and I could probably add more spokes. I haven't amended this diagram for a, a year or so but probably should, you know, change management, behaviour, strategy, position, tone of voice, naming, logo, symbols, brand expression, uh, then all the stuff we used to do but uh, also of course we have electronics, advertising, vehicles and fleet. That's an extraordinary gamut, a, a huge kind of diagram of stuff that we now have to do. That's still important. That is now incredibly important and the way those two things relate to each other is really important. This is increasingly, weirdly, a channel of the process, which uh, to the ad community w within the room might not be too happy about that, but that's life, really. Um, and then I started talking about the verbal and the visual brand, just as a way to differentiate the two from each other so that people can understand what I'm on about, really. So that's a big change. I'll give you a quick example of what I mean. Um, we used to talk about... That, um, I'll, I'm going to use examples from different sectors, OK, just because it's makes life easier. Think about museums, okay, that's a symbol for a museum if you're wondering what my slightly shit grey <laughs> icon stands for. It looks more like a skyscraper actually now I think about it, never mind. Uh, anyway, traditionally it used to be, you used to go there, you, maybe you'd buy a book, maybe look at a video, read a review maybe. It was a simple system, yeah. Or it's, this has really, really changed and I'm just using museums as an example. You've got a clearly defined place and there are physical visitors but of course increasingly there are online visitors of course. The entire MoMA collection, as you probably know, now know, is online. Everything in MoMA is now online. I happen to know that the V&A a few years ago, and two years ago, had three and a half million visitors in person. They had 30 million visitors online. Okay? Ten times as many people visited uh, virtually than in an analog way. And then, so what, what's starting to happen, if you think about it, if you think about that 10 to 1 relationship, is that the... If the brand of a museum is in the middle of the diagram, really, the building's not in the middle of the diagram anymore, the place. Actually, it's just one of the things that is delivered along with an online shop or the video, the channels or the whatever, the Facebook, the, all of these kind of things. Yeah, there's a huge amount of stuff. And it's all kind of encompassed by Google search, yeah, which has negated most museums' homepages completely because people look for something that they want to find and off they go to the guts of a website rather than the carefully crafted web website homepage that we all catastrophize about on a daily basis. <laughs> so, breadth, uh, flexibility. Now, uh, flexibility, I used to be, and I'm still really fascinated by flexibility. I think flexibility has been a hot topic in my and your business for a while now. This post-war, if you like, there's, there's been this definition of corporate identity which has been this fixed, consistent thing which is beautifully done and hovers in the corner of something, um, which is fine, but what really started to happen in the 90s, and this is an early, some examples of what they call Google Doodles, which you know all about, is that this seemed to open the, the floodgates to people um, kind of act, uh, accepting that perhaps some of the experiments that televisual brands have been doing with flexibility could move into a different space. So we then, um, and there's a very influential scheme by Bruce Mao in the 90s uh, for the Netherlands Architecture Institute where everything moved in and out of focus. So what you found in really a sort of 10-year uh, period, there were some very influential schemes that really made people think about flexibility and identity and branding. Uh, that's the Brooklyn Museum there done. That was, that's uh, 11 years old, that scheme at the bottom there, which is interesting, isn't it? It doesn't look 11 years old. It looks like it could have been done uh, yesterday, really. Uh, the first ideas always do. Yeah? The first good ideas, or first good uh, iterations of a good idea. Um, always look that way. But what's happened since is there's been a lot of other stuff, yeah. Um, now I personally think some of the stuff on here is great, actually. Um, that's the exhibition at the VNA. This is Michael Barrett's scheme for Saks Fifth Avenue, which takes the logo and cuts it up and then reorientates it. Some interesting stuff. And then, of course, the Whitney scheme, which I think won Dine D last year, didn't it? I think, yes, I think it did. Um, <coughs> which I'm, I'm sure you have seen, but in case you haven't, it kind of expands and contracts into different spaces, and you can kind of use the version of the logo that you want to use in a different space. So it's uh, intellectually a very interesting idea, really, that it could kind of expand and contract in that way. Now, the reason why I kind of preface this section with a question mark is because I'm wondering a bit about this, because 
you know, th that's a great looking slide if you look at the experimental jet, site, jet set website, hard to say, sorry. Um, but actually, in reality, on the street in New York, it looks like this. And you start to think, hmm, I wonder how long that's really going to work. You do start to wonder a little bit. And it isn't that difficult to find examples of kind of m maximum flexibility, if you like, that actually are not really flexible anymore. So this, this is a lovely scheme that Wolf Erlens did for the South Bank a few years ago. Now, wh where it is now is not where it started. Okay? It started there, this kind of very expansive, interesting scheme. Now, look where it is. It's the thing at the bottom of the poster again, you know, which is probably what it was designed to replace. Yeah? We don't want to be the thing at the bottom of the poster or in the corner. We want to be this expansive scheme that you see on the left. So that's really why I have that question about flexibility. And I think there has to be a reason for flexibility, even though, of course, we can all deliver flexibility really well now. Clarity and being really clear about someone, what people do is... I think in this kind of busy, frenetic lives and world we all live in, there's a, there's a real desire to understand what lies at the core of something. Now, there's lots of jargon about this, but uh, there's a really interesting book which is worth reading called Start With Why. Okay, this is a great book, highly recommended. It's about leadership technically, but that phrase, start with why, Ask yourself, why is someone doing something? It's a really useful thing to do. Quick example, we've been working with UNICEF in the UK. Tons of activity, none of it really linking up. We said to them, well, what's above the waterline, if you like? Um, and we said to them, OK, well, there's basically you've got to do one thing. You've got to get the word child near the word UNICEF because only 38% of people in research on the street in Hoxton actually realised that UNICEF was a children's charity. It's the world's biggest children's organisation, but six, I can't do the math, 62% of people in the UK didn't know that. That's what the C stands for. Um, so we said, well, it's simple, guys. You've got to put that there. And there needs to be some emotional connection to the brand. So this, we've just been doing this. So every time you see UNICEF in the UK, it says, for every child in danger. So that for every makes, talks about that global reach. And child, obviously, <laughs> why we're here. And danger is an interesting word because you can use danger to make people donate, if you like, but it also has this great antonym of safety. So what I mean is well, now they have this clarity. They can do, if they want to, things which are very, very powerful and very, very punchy. And they could not do this before, OK? Oh, my God, FGM. There are some acronyms that sh just shouldn't exist. Now, they were just not capable of doing a bit of comms like this before um, because they, didn't really have, they hadn't set up the idea in people's heads that they are there for every child in danger. That's what I mean by clarity and clearness of purpose. It's manifesto. I do love a good manifesto. This is the original, the original Marinetti from the 19, 1915, I think, I can't remember, or 1919, when was it? We intend to sing to the love of danger, the habit of energy and fearlessness. Great, huh? Imagine saying that in a meeting now. <laughs> there is no beauty that does not consist of struggle. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, this is the original. This is where it all emanates from, from a man manifesto point of view. But there's something really great about manifesto, and you see manifesto a lot. And a lot of people then refer back to this as the next great iteration of Manifesto. This is and beautifully written about in the Jobs book, if you have read that book. Or if you haven't, then I highly recommend you just read the bit about Manifesto. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the tr troublemakers. Then this was Jobs' way of kind of realigning Apple back to where he th saw that they should be. And, and this idea about Manifesto is really interesting because you, within you know, 150 words or 100 words or 50 words, you're saying what you stand for and what you believe in. Um, quick example that we've been working on, this is, um, this is an a, a open data organisation that wants to free up public data, not personal data, public data, called Open Knowledge. We spent a lot of time trying to agree with them what they, you know, what they stood for and what they did, and we run these workshops and we'd write this a narrative and they say, no, that's shit, that's shit, and that doesn't get us at all. And then at one point, one crucial point, key director gets up and he writes on the board pretty much this. I didn't really write this, I just kind of cleaned up his syntax. You know, a world where knowledge creates the power for the many, not the few. A world where data freezes, can make informed choices about how we live. A world where information and insights are accessible and apparent to everyone. This is the world we choose. Now, all of a sudden, they've gone from this slightly neutral-looking, albeit 10-year-old open data organisation, into this rallying movement, which was really interesting. Then we took one of their projects. This is a, the world's, a, a census of the world's data, and whether it's open or not, by country. And we spin it in a circle and we create a kind of living pie chart of information. So what they get is they get this uh, unusual and data-derived uh, brand, but also they get these great phrases, a world where knowledge creates power for the many, not the few, and this kind of thing. 
I think we're going to see more of this. I think that people really sticking their colours to the mast and saying, this is what we stand for. I really think you... I mean, even if you walk into Pret now, you'll see a manifesto on the wall, yeah? Manifesto is a big news. I mean, of course, it means that in five years' time, I'll probably say, of course, manifestos are really out. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not, actually, because I love manifestos. I love a statement of intent and a statement of truth and honesty. I'm, you can kind of tell where I'm going with this, really. Relationships, well, obviously we talk a lot about relationships and branding at the moment because you, when my previous life, when you just did a corporate identity, there was no relationship there. The only relationship you had was with the personal and client side who approved the logo. Now, we're, we're talking about the way that a any brands can relate to another. And this kind of relationship is, thing is really intriguing. So you might have Beckham, for example, establishing a relationship with UNICEF and this, doing this thing called Seven that we've just done for them. So, in effect, this is a co-brand between one brand, the Beckham brand, and the UNICEF brand, and coming together under one name. We're going to see more of this, I think, this kind of weird kind of relationship. You could call it affinity marketing or, or co-branding, if you like. But really, uh, I'm, this is on slide because I was talking to a researcher that I'm doing some work with at the moment, and she was saying that her kids were playing a game the other day that involved Lego and Batman. And she, sh she said, what are you doing? And, she, and they said, we're playing Lego Batman. And, and, and I don't think there is a Lego Batman actually in existence, but they had created Lego Batman by just thwacking the two brands together, if you like. There's going to be more of this because you've got a whole generation of people growing up playing Lego Batman or bashing things together. The, the ability of, for, of brands, and Dan's going to talk about this a lot, I hope, it, the ability of an electronic brand to establish a relationship is fascinating. This is the page I started for the Airbnb site where I was theoretically going to make my own symbol in Michael in Brick Lane, although I didn't want to agree to their terms and conditions, so I stopped. <laughs> but you could. <laughs> Just the example. Uh, the Airbnb rebrand is quite an interesting case study, actually, because um, you, whether you like it or not, there's, there's some bit really nice bits of it. I especially like this bit where they, they, they then... Um, um, released a report about what the, 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 the logo had been compared to. And they, they said publicly, well, our new logo, this is only like 10 days after it was launched, has been compared to animals, body parts, foods, and transportation. And that's the kind of the, how transparent a brand can be. Um, this thing about you know, establishing a relationship with the customer, well, how far can that really go? You know, designing your own logo, well, OK. We're working on a little project at the moment that you know, it, most banks and, and to a slightly lesser degree, building society are pretty impersonal and they're aiming at individuals, you know, down here in the bottom right hand corner. But there's a kind of personal family space that maybe you could do something in. And we've been working with a client that they, they've, they've called the, their new offer, if you like, the Family Building Society. Granted, it's not the world's most imaginative name, but the truth is they're aiming at families. It's a very simple idea. We're going to do something for families because families are forever gen lending money to each other. Yeah? Granny lends to grandson, etc., etc. They're called intergenerational giving, in case you're interested. Mm -hmm. The idea of this, though, the reason why I'm showing you this is because there's this really interesting thing we're trying to build into it where you can personalise the identity. So the Williams Family Building Society. And you know when you have that kind of uh, typing field on the word file when you send a letter? Well, just move the field and stick it on the letter. You know, so... And so you can personalise the letter and say, well, this is the family building society for you, Mr Johnson. Or, and then you can talk about the Jenkins family and all the things they're thinking about, mum's house, the divorce, the wedding, ask dad for a loan, and there's dad panicking, or uh, you know, all, the, all the different things. You know, she's thinking about the business NPR, their great novel, Trouble. You know, all the things that people are thinking about, or the, she's thinking about the car, tax man downsizing, and the cat wants its supper. You know, that kind of personal way to talk about a brand. I think it's hard to do, to be fair. It's early days for this idea as well. It's only, it's less, it's about six months old. It's really hard to do this kind of stuff. But it is just theoretically possible now, so it could be really possible soon. Authenticity, we hear a lot about this. If you're kind of into reading about this kind of thing, you will already know this, what I'm about to tell you, that baby boomers were, kind of went from flower power to crisis, and the Generation X was kind of Culturally diverse, loved accountability. Gen Y, millennials, Gen X, i.e. most of the room apart from me and Martin. Um, tech savvy, craving attention, allegedly. This is not me, okay? Uh, I've looked all of this up, okay? You are craving attention. You love feedback. Uh, you're civically minded, which is interesting. And you value fairness and authenticity, okay? Interesting. I'm sorry, I pigeonholed the entire room. Well, most of the room. Um, and that's interesting. How does that, how's that coming across in branding? Well, okay. Actually, we all secretly know that Byron's a chain, yeah? It's Byron's a chain. <laughs> okay. But, look, clever, huh? It's clever. 
you know, they, they change the way the restaurants look depending on where it is in the city. It's kind of clever, but we all know it's a chain. But, but it's kind of clever, you know. Um, I, I don't know if you've, any of you have stayed at an Ace Hotel. Each, each Ace Hotel is completely different. They're all Ace Hotels. Um, it's really interesting. They don't even try to link it all up. They just try really hard to make it look really authentic. So when you're in the New, New York one, bottom left, it feels really New York. Authenticity, it's quite hard though, when you think about it from a global perspective. It's really hard in a way, when you come out of our kind of tech savvy, uh, this kind of culturally aware Gen X, Y, millennial, wherever we are today. If you move into different countries, it's quite tricky. Because if you think about, say you're establishing a brand in somewhere like India, thus far, they've established brands that could look like they could be anywhere. Yeah? There's no authenticity about these kind of brands. Apologies if any of you designed any of them. There isn't really. And then, of course, when you go to India, there's all this stuff you find around you and you love and you think, no, that's authentically Indian. Um, uh, what they are starting to do, I'm using India as an example, they are starting to realise they have this fantastic kind of craft tradition. And maybe we will soon see less of that and more of this, perhaps. Um, this is an, a kind of early example of it. They've revived the Royal Enfield brand only in India. Yeah? You can buy these Royal Enfield bikes and you can customise your tank, a bit like the Harley brand in the States, yeah? but like the Royal Enfield brand in India. It's going in this super authentic way. And you can actually now buy these in uh, London as well, I think. Um, authenticity's got a weird kind of flip side to it, of course, because as some of you... <laughs> actually, how many of you think that super dry is actually Japanese? Eh? That was a slightly loaded question. Wasn't it? <laughs> that, super dry is based in Cheltenham, okay? I looked it up before. That, that says Kyokudo Kansu Shinasai, okay, above super dry. It's really badly translated. It says max dry brackets do. Okay? They're just, you know, it's bonkers, actually. <laughs> it's completely inauthentic. They don't have any shops in Japan. Yeah? But it presents itself as an authentically Japanese brand. It's crazy, really, and eventually someone will out them. Maybe I just have. <laughs> so sorry, boys and Cheltenham, looks into camera. But, um, but there's an interesting... So, but the flip side of that kind of thing, if you, look, if you think about uh, Uniqlo which started with an American name. It's a weird story, this unique, unique clothing warehouse that became Uniqlo. But actually, at a certain po point, not that long ago, actually, they decided that, no, actually, we want to be authentically Japanese. No, this is who we are. We're Japanese. And so now you have this kind of dual brand, a double language identity that lives on the high streets of the world, really. And it, it doesn't say Uniqlo. It says Unikuro. That's what it says in phonetic Japanese. And, and you have this fantastic idea of kind of going back into, well, we're Japanese and we're going to tell the world. I, again, I think we're going to see more of this authentic, real, we are from here, we're not pretending to be an organisation in the middle of the Atlantic. Well, this is what I hope, at least. Um, although when I show some of those e earlier slides when I go to India, I get beaten up by a lot of people um, who actually, paradoxically, want to design like Massimo Vignelli and don't want to do anything authentically Indian. And, but maybe we'll come back to that. The greater good, to finish. Um, Okay, some of this is a bit kind of far out and a bit high, I will admit, but I think that some of this is going to trickle down. You can see this when you go to an airport, you go to a train station, go and find the bit which is on, quote, self-help and, and quotes emotional intelligence. There's a whole rack of books there, okay? People, and some of you, by definition, are really interested in looking inside themselves to find out where they go next, okay? This is a really interesting area that hasn't yet percolated down really into branding, but it will do, I'm sure it will. Because you're starting to see it. Okay, you're thinking, I don't want to buy Emotional Intelligence 2.0. What the fuck is that? No. <coughs> but, but then you look at the Alain de Botton's School of Life and you think, well, that's interesting. It's not religious. It's all about getting in touch with who you are, little events coming up, uh, how to stay sane, the virtues of resilience. You think, well, that's interesting. This is kind of uh, looking for a more of an inner calm, if you like, about this. And this is kind of, you're starting to see this expressed uh, both internally and externally, where you see things like Tom's. Now, we could debate the pros and cons of this, but this is the brand that, that if you buy the shoes, they give away a pair of shoes, which some of you will know about. It's there, there when you examine the business model, it's a bit rickety when you, when you go down past the homepage, but you know, it's an interesting idea, yeah? 